One of the things that makes Bubble stand out is the ability to design beautiful UI that's responsive to different screen sizes. Our next instructor is an icon in the Bubble community for being an industry leader on no-code design principles, Gregory John. Hey guys, Greg here. Today I wanted to build a responsive nav bar to show you some of the tools available to us uh, via the Bubble responsive engine. So on the screen, we currently have a desktop width of a navigation bar. And if I click down to mobile widths, we can see that the design changes. Okay, this is quite straightforward. And I wanted to demonstrate how we can build this in a modular approach without having copies of elements, etc. So I've just jumped ahead just to construct um, the nav bar at a desktop width, but I'm going to go through with you what I've done so far. Okay, so we have a nav bar that is a type of element floating group, and this is a reusable element, meaning that we design in this editor, and we can just drag and drop it onto any page where we need this nav bar to function. So on this nav bar, I have on the layout tab, I've set the default builder width to 1400. That's just my page width preference, and this is the builder width just to match the page. Maybe you build a 1200, in which instance you would set this to 1200. And I have chosen to put 32 pixels of left to right padding on the reusable nav bar itself. Okay. Now in the element tree, next we have the group container. And the purpose of the group container is to contain the elements within with a max width of 1200, which we can see I've set over here. The purpose of this is for a better user experience. If you're on a large screen, what you don't want is the icon or the branding all the way in the top left-hand corner, and then the login sign-up buttons all the way in the right-hand side, and then the links in the middle, but they're all separated. No, well, good user experience means we have a contained max width, and I choose to have that at 1200. Um, that's just a creative choice. If I open this group container, we can see that the group container has three columns within, which means the group container on the layout tab is distributed as a row. So the group column on the left has my layers branding, and then it has this little touch, mobile touch icon here. Okay, and we're going to only show that beneath a breakpoint. It's going to be hidden on page load. Then on the right hand side, we have group links set to row container, container alignment in the center. So when I set container alignment on this group here, it affects the distribution and the layout of the child elements, which are these text elements. Let me show you right now. So if I choose left, we can see that they move left, center, right, space around, space between. So a lot of granular control over the distribution and layout of these elements. Then on the right hand side, my third group column with container alignment on the right. Okay, container alignment on the right. So how do we achieve this design responsively where we see this on the right hand side, but we don't see these groups? First of all, let's jump into the responsive editor and let's have a look at the design. Now I'm just going to uh, hide this group and it's I've checked collapse when hidden. We want that, otherwise the space will remain even though we don't see it. Okay, if I expand my element tree first column, I can bring it back if I need to see it. I don't want to see it for now. So at 1200, our design looks great. 992, design looking good. 768, things are getting a little bit tight here. Okay, if I had another link here, it probably wouldn't work. Text links would start to wrap. So I'm going to, I'm going to configure this design to adapt at one pixel below 768. So if I had to drag this handle down, this is where I wanted to adapt. Okay, I'm gonna click 768 breakpoint for now. And just to confirm that a breakpoint is basically the width of the browser that your user is viewing it on. So we can instruct the design to change depending on what the user's current width is. Really, really powerful. So we can change alignment, distribution, all sorts of things. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is the group a mobile touch group that I've created. I have that set that is not visible in page load. It is collapsed when hidden to free up that extra space. And I'm going to write a new conditional statement. I'm gonna type the word page to bring up the filter option. 
and I'm going to choose other data sources current page width. I'm then going to choose the operator the less than sign because I want it below 768. I'm going to type 768 to bring up the default mobile landscape breakpoint and I click that. That is our statement. Okay. And then I'm going to say, well, below 768, it is visible. I'm going to right click and copy expression to save myself a bit of time because we're going to be using this expression in other areas. For instance, if I head over to the center column, I'm going to define a condition. I'm going to paste an expression I've just copied. Current page width is smaller than 768. So now I want to actually hide this because if I'm showing the mobile menu icon, then I want to hide this group. So I'm going to check that this element is not visible. But I need to make sure that we collapse in the space, like I said earlier. If we don't collapse the space when it's hidden, that means that the space will remain. We just won't see the group. And that is not what we want. So I'm going to just have a quick look. Uh, the element is visible on page load. Yes, I do want that. But now I'm going to check to collapse when hidden. Okay, and to save myself even more time, I'm going to right click. I'm going to say copy special, copy conditional expressions of this group because we have the same conditional expressions on the right hand group. I also want this to be hidden below 768. So I'm going to paste special, paste conditional expressions. But I'm also going to make sure that we collapse the space. So it frees up, those two groups have freed up all of that space, which means that the group on the left, this group column, is now going to occupy that space. This is what I love about uh, the responsive engine that Bubble is built on called Flexbox. It sort of thinks for us. That space is available, it's going to fill that space. So we're at 768. Let's have a look. So if I pull this handle in, gone. Can you see how this group is now filling the space and it is showing this group? Fantastic. So what else do we want? Well, at mobile widths, um, it's a good design practice to actually lessen the amount of padding so we can utilize more screen space. A mobile phone, the screen size is very, very small. We don't need a lot of padding. So I'm gonna use the same breakpoint Current page width is smaller than 768. So that expression, I'm going to pop over. I've got the group, sorry, I've got the reusable nav bar highlighted because that's where the padding is. So I'm going to say page with a current page width, less than sign. I'm going to type 768 to filter the options. And then I'm going to say pad left 16. This is just a bootstrap standard and a creative choice. It's up to you what you want to do here, 16. So let's drop beneath 768 and you can see that now the padding is far less so that at 320 we're utilizing a lot more screen width. All right folks and now it's up to you how you'd like to build this um, mobile menu that could be in a pop-up, could be in a sidebar, could drop down another group but that's for another tutorial. I hope you enjoyed today. To get the ball rolling, I have a question for you, Greg. What would you sure. say are common pitfalls that you see when designing in Bubble's responsive engine? Yeah, I can give um, two examples, one sort of high level and then the other one pertaining to something I've just actually taught. The first one is um, when we think about design, we should be thinking about a systematic approach to design. So what I see often with uh, new bubble developers is they just want to build a feature and make it work. And then uh, because design is an afterthought, they sit in the responsive tab, really tussling and fighting with the responsive settings. And now we start to get design drift. You know, the user experience is, deg is, is degraded. So what we really need to think about over time, and it does take a bit of time, is de a design system. What are the breakpoints that we're using throughout our app? And a and what happens at those breakpoints, such as the padding reduces, maybe margins change, maybe columns and rows, the distribution changes. So that would be the first thing. Have a system in place. Systems make design a lot more straightforward, and you don't need to be a good designer when you've got good systems, because good, good systems ensure consistency. The second one, if I could just be more direct, because I mentioned max width, and one of the other common pitfalls I see is often developers forget or choose not to set a max width. Now, if we think about, for instance, Twitter is a good example. It's just a slither of content down the center. Maybe 
Yeah, but that, that again is a design choice based on the user experience. They want you to be able to move your mouse around and click very close together. All the content is very close together. So you can navigate a lot more easily. So I would think about if I was designing specifically marketing pages, you want a max width of about 1200, could be 1400. The numbers don't actually don't matter. The main thing is that you have a consistent approach. And then if you're doing dashboards as well, I wouldn't have a dashboard fill an entire screen because, you know, I'm on a huge screen right now. And if I had to open up a dashboard without a max width, then I'd be moving my mouse all the way across and I'd probably be getting a pretty good sort of bicep routine going. However, we want to reduce um, the amount of work someone needs to do when they're moving the mouse around. So max widths, please, they are very important. Awesome, super helpful advice. I'm actually seeing a question in the chat. Um, I think a beginner is wondering, would it be okay to build at 1200 and then later work on scalability? And would there be things that they would need to take into account um, in that 1200 build that would help to enable scaling in the future? So the 1200 pertains to um, just kind of a, a max width, what I was talking about, it's a screen real estate. Um, we need to make a distinction between the bubble builder UI width and what a user is viewing uh, your application on. So when I talk about 1200, um, I'm talking about two things. One of them is the, the, the builder width, it could be 1200, 1400, but then also having a max width to ensure that the user experience is improved for people on very large screens. So yeah, I if I can give you an example of my settings, I actually build with a bubble UI width for the for the editor itself at 1400. And I'm on a slightly larger screen. You can build at 1200 as well. It doesn't really matter whatever you decide, but just remember that your users will be viewing your designs on 2100 wide down to 320. So we have to think about that when we're building um, in particular. Awesome, very helpful. We also have a question about what exactly does it mean for an element to be visible on page load? Could you clarify that for us? Yes, absolutely. So it's the way we build um, in any kind of language is we, we only want to render on the screen what a person needs to see. Now, if, um, if I load the nav bar and someone's screen is really wide, they will be viewing different groups, won't they? Because I've instructed Bubble to have the desktop navbar design look different to the mobile navbar. And if you think about a dashboard, if we have a menu down the left-hand side and we have various buttons, that could be overview, sales, users. Well, in the dashboard design, it's a single page design. So all of the pages, sorry, all of the groups are actually hidden by default. And we only show a group when it is needed such as on a page load or someone has clicked the sales button, now we show the sales group. That's what it means. Awesome, amazing. Uh, we definitely have users who use Bubble to build mobile apps. So I'm seeing a question about mobile layouts and I'm wondering hmm. how would a user go about resizing text and repeating groups? And do you just have any advice in general about building for mobile? Absolutely, uh, and I, I love this kind of question because I do so much work uh, to make sure that the mobile experience is great. Because if we think about our daily lives, we are using our mobile phones for everything. Um, and I use breakpoints. So we talked about the 768 breakpoint. There are other breakpoints we can use. Another good mobile breakpoint is 576. If you guys want to do some research, have a look at Bootstrap, Bootstrap breakpoints. So those are the ones I use. So what we want to do at mobile widths there's a lot of work to be done. So first of all, like I mentioned, we want less padding so we can have more screen real estate, okay? We want to reduce the size of our heading text, but not our body text. Specifically because we have double density on phones. So if we reduce the body text even further, it's going to be difficult to read. So there are many things like that that I'll do. I'll reduce, um, I'll actually make the buttons bigger, but, but I'll make the heading smaller. And I'll also, probably look at various weights when it comes to mobile phones. I wouldn't have text as weighty on a mobile phone, but it's again, it's one of these things that you need to try uh, and you know build on desktop, look at it on a mobile phone. When I build responsibly, I don't use the responsive editor very much because I know the outcome already, 
but I often will pick up my phone at the end of the day and just do a quick quick scroll through, and then that would you know help inform what my next maneuver is. Awesome, very helpful. Um, next, I'm going to combine sort of two questions into one. I'm seeing a question about how you would recommend um, translating work in Figma to Bubble. Figma is obviously a very popular design tool that a lot of founders use. So do you have a recommendation around um, what the ideal workflow would be if someone is starting in Figma to mock things up and then wanting to move it over to Bubble? Absolutely, and Figma is a tool I use every day. So I use Figma and I use Bubble. I work in Teams and I think it's a good process if you work in a team to actually start with the designs because that would help help founders or companies you're building for. That will help inform what does it look and feel and you'll be able to collect a lot of um, feedback before you start building in Bubble. So, I mean, I do it the long route because I love design. I can design all day. So I will sit in Figma um, uh, and I'll, I'll create a desktop 1400 width, I'll create a 992 tablet, and I'll create a 375. I'll work with all of those designs. And because Figma also uses auto layout and has Flexbox capabilities, you can just bring across basically the same settings. Building in Figma and building in Bubble isn't actually too different. Um, when you become comfortable with Bubble, you realize the power of it and how actually you can build incredible designs in Bubble. It's just more of an education kind of process you need to go through for that. But if you can build in Figma and you're good at design in Figma, you'll be exceptional in Bubble. I'd say Bubble is even easier. Love that. If you can build in Figma, you can build in Bubble. Um, I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. Um, what is the advantage of the floating group versus the group for the navbar? Yes, yeah, so floating group, if we talk about a Z axis, that creates elevation. Floating groups elevate above the page, which means that we can now, if you think of a navigation bar, we can create sticky navigation bars. So as you scroll down the page, the navigation bar remains in place. So the users can always get to the CTAs they need to. Sign up, log in, go to the sales page, sign out but they can still obviously scroll the page. So we just have to think of a floating group as floating above the page. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We are at time. Really appreciate you walking us through how to build a responsive nav bar. Most apps are going to need some way for users to navigate from page to page. And now all of you can build a nav bar that looks great on any screen size.